China's social credit system has preoccupied Westerners' imagination since 2015. An interest in it had only increased in the context of COVID vaccine mandates and other policies related to the pandemic, which are seen to be an ideological and political import from China. Worse yet, China's system is imagined to be like an episode from the show Black Mirror, where each citizen has a score that determines their position in society. However, this has absolutely nothing to do with reality. The vast majority of information on the social credit system in the Western world has done more to mystify rather than elucidate. One of the very first English language articles on the Chinese system, which appeared in late 2015, is very illustrative here. The organization which prepared the article did not even operate in China. And, as it turned out later and was admitted by the author himself, the article was based on rumors and speculations as opposed to concrete analysis or any familiarity with China, and it expressed author's own anxieties about digital oligarchies in the West. However, this very approach came to form the basis and the essence of the narrative on China's social credit system in the West. And while Western media tend to present China's system as a dark secret underbelly of the communist rule, as a matter of fact, both the system and the documents related to it are open to public scrutiny. And instead of being oppressed and controlled by the system, Chinese citizens themselves let their views be known. Western experts who work in this field, even if critical of China and its system, constantly note how the popular narrative in the West has little connection to reality. In order to appreciate the complex reality of China's system, it is important to understand the very meaning of the phrase social credit system. For one thing, the word credit in China, depending on context, can mean both credit and trustworthiness. As we will see later, it is much more correct to translate and understand it precisely as social trustworthiness system rather than social credit system. Secondly, China's social credit system is understood in the West as a finished monolithic mechanism of social control, where citizens are ranked and segregated based on their numerical social credit rating, which is influenced by one's views and actions and then come to determine their socioeconomic status. However, in reality, it is very difficult to even call it a system, because in essence, it is just a collection of political and legal guidelines for solving certain very concrete problems in Chinese society. As such, instead of being a unified monolithic system, it encompasses many different initiatives to solve many different problems facing Chinese citizens. The major source of Western misconception is precisely an inability to distinguish between these different initiatives and their different goals, scopes and purposes. But before we delve deeper into what China's social credit system is, let us begin by asking why it was conceived and initiated in the first place. After the Cultural Revolution and Mao's death, the Communist Party, led by Deng Xiaoping, initiated the policy of reform and opening up, which, among other things, meant that China was becoming a socialist market economy. The result was an unprecedented economic growth and an unparalleled pace of modernization. The processes that took hundreds of years in the West and the side effects of which were amortized through colonialist policy happened in several decades in China without any help from the outside. The Chinese state had difficulty keeping up with the space of modernization and controlling its most pernicious side effects. Even such basic things as enforcement of the law were lacking due to an insufficiently developed legal system and a weak legal state apparatus. This meant, for instance, that even as late as last decade, market scandals were almost a daily occurrence in China. Illustrative here is 2008 scandal where baby milk powder was found to be deliberately contaminated with melamine, which resulted in 300,000 babies getting sick. Similar food, vaccine and other product quality scandals were a constant occurrence in China. Add to that various fraudulent financial schemes, unpaid salaries and loans, restaurant hygiene scandals, weighted contracts and unmet obligations and you have an enormous problem. Top that with the inability of the Chinese state to enforce the law and you have a social crisis of trust. It is important to realize that instead of being an omnipotent totalitarian power, the Chinese state has been, in fact, extremely decentralized ever since the reform and opening up. There exists very limited cooperation not only between separate regional governments, but also between separate governmental institutions in general. 
Among other things, what this meant with regards to the law was that even if a culprit was found guilty, they could simply refuse to fulfill their legal obligations and move to another region without any repercussions. In fact, many culprits having their fraudulent activities dissolved in one region could simply start over by setting up in another region. This was also partly a result of the fact that China lacked even a basic unified national datasets. Separate regions and even separate governmental institutions used their own identifiers and constructed their own datasets, so it was not uncommon for business entities to have close to a dozen separate IDs. The emergence of China's social credit system was an acknowledgement that China's judicial system was ill-equipped to address these issues of market misconduct. The founding document of the system stated that only a small portion of such infringements result in criminal prosecution and judicial punishment. The majority of contract violations and other untrustworthy phenomena cannot be resolved through criminal investigation and judicial trial, and even in the event that a judicial trial occurs, there are still considerable difficulties in enforcement of the judgment. The contract violations that the social credit system seeks to address is precisely this type of untrustworthy economic activity, those which are inconvenient to prosecute under public security laws. Therefore, at its most basic, China's social credit system was first conceived in 1999 as an attempt at unification and standardization of corporate datasets and as a mechanism of enforcing the law and ensuring the meeting of legal obligations, without which Chinese authorities understood ongoing crises of trustworthiness would tear the social fabric apart. The founding document identified its key aims as a prevention of production safety accidents, food and drug security incidents, commercial deception, production and sales of counterfeit products, tax evasion, fraudulent financial claims, academic impropriety and other such phenomena which cannot be stopped in spite of repeated bans. A parallel problem that the system was conceived to address was the same that was faced by virtually every western state at some point in its history, lack of credit ratings that would facilitate financial activity. Lacking such financial indicators which would let banks determine financial credibility of a borrower, Chinese banks by and large lent only to biggest corporations and state-backed or owned businesses. Private individuals as well as small and medium-sized businesses simply lacked access to credit. This meant that for a very long time the Chinese economy was driven by cash transactions which became increasingly unfeasible as the economy developed. And even now, more than 200 million Chinese do not have an account with any financial institution and only 40% have any form of official financial history at all. Chinese officials tried various political means to force financial institutions to lend to small and medium-sized businesses. However, lacking necessary financial indicators to measure credit worthiness, these political measures would not have any positive long-term implications. An attempt to develop financial rating was one of the factors that spurred the development of what came to be known as a social credit system. And now, with the rise of Xi Jinping, the social credit system was conceptually extended from corporate actors and the market sphere to society at large, including the government itself, because it was understood that it was not only the crisis in the marketplace, but a moral social crisis of values, where greed, selfishness, vulgar materialism, excessive consumption, corruption and related problems were tearing Chinese society apart and diminishing the authority of the Communist Party. As a response, spiritual civilization construction was initiated, the goal of which was propagation of patriotic socialist values. It was soon incorporated in the political and legal guidelines that we today know as the social credit system, recontextualizing it as a set of guidelines to foster a culture of law-abiding sincerity and civic responsibility, increasing judicial credibility, improving the efficiency of regulatory and administrative services, and ensuring local governments honor commitments to the people, the party, and the state. Contrary to some abstract thirst for social control on the part of the Communist Party, it is these very concrete, tangible problems that stand as the context for the origins of the social credit system. It was conceived as a data-driven mechanism to restore social trust in Chinese society. However, it is important to note that contrary to the dominant narrative in the West, it was not really conceived or developed as an extension of state power at the expense of civil society, but quite the opposite. It was meant as a tool for market self-regulation without unnecessary intervention by the state bureaucracy. 
For instance, by making certain non-sensitive data available for public use, various applications were developed that allowed the public to filter businesses based on various criteria of trustworthiness. Furthermore, the thinking went that by being able to distinguish good market actors from bad ones, for instance, by measuring the history of their compliance with the pre-existing regulations and laws, regulators could focus their attention on the bad actors instead of wasting resources and bothering the good actors, and so reducing the bureaucratic overhaul of over Chinese society. This is how China's social credit system was conceived and articulated in various documents. Let us now analyze how it actually functions in practice and what kind of different initiatives comprise it. As was mentioned before, local governments could easily bypass it and the central government had no way to really enforce the requirement to efficiently check upon its implementation or ensure that the measure is even taken in the first place. Social credit system is supposed to tear down the protective walls surrounding local governments. On the one hand, it is expected to increase transparency by standardizing and centralizing corporate data and making it publicly available, and on the other hand, it will give the central government the tools to bypass insubordinate local governments through so-called national blacklists. Contrary to Black Mirror dystopia, it is precisely these blacklists, and not any numerical rating, that forms the basis of the social credit system as it is used by the central government. As was mentioned before, the central issue that faced China's legal system was its inability to enforce both the law and court rulings. Blacklists were a direct governmental response to this problem. The mechanism of blacklists is rather straightforward. When a person or a business has a court ruling against them and refuses to carry it out, they are placed on a blacklist until they carry out their obligations. Being placed on a blacklist has widespread consequences. One becomes unable to travel, cannot buy luxury items, cannot receive honorary titles, join the Communist Party, hold high positions in state-owned enterprises, and so on. Sometimes, they are also publicly shamed. Such deliberately disproportionate sanctions are meant to lead to an establishment of a more trustworthy environment and ensure that court obligations are fulfilled. This is the only mechanism related to the social credit system that is used by the national government and, as we can see, it has absolutely nothing to do with ascribing citizens or businesses a numerical score. Blacklists are not even a parallel system to the law and the judiciary, it only attempts to ensure the enforcement of court rulings and it is made explicitly clear that nobody can be put on a blacklist without a prior court ruling. Such blacklisting is used not only by the central government, but by local governments and separate governmental institutions. However, negative implications for those on such lists are usually less severe and limited to their respective fields of expertise. By most recent estimations, only up to half percent of the population is affected by local blacklisting annually. Much more importantly though, local governments are responsible for giving a concrete form to the social credit system as it is abstractly conceptualized in the law. As is usual in China, this development is decentralized so that every local government can experiment and try to find a workable form of social credit system for their specific conditions and within the limits of the guidelines that are ultimately set by the central government. Various lessons are drawn and adjustments are made in the process of these developments. This is a source of misconceptions in the West, because Westerners take a particular limited and experimental local program to be reflective of a national development and the views of the central government. It is difficult to even draw commonalities between different regions, considering that the social credit system is supposed to solve very broad problems of trust and virtue. So, for example, when in 2017 the government designated 12 particularly successful local initiatives from which important lessons could be learned, it encompassed such things as incentivizing transparency of local businesses and organizations, making credit information easy to access to the public, establishing ranking system for business based on their regulatory compliance, and so on and so forth. As far as local citizens are concerned, the range of initiative was also very broad. In Rongcheng, for example, exemplary citizens are praised by being displayed on public spaces, encouraging other citizens to emulate the behavior that is deemed exceptional. Authorities in Shanghai developed an application which integrates publicly available data and allows users to check the trustworthiness of local businesses as well as their own personal grade. 
the usage of the app is entirely voluntary and there are no consequences for having a low grade. This is, as a matter of fact, an explicit policy formulated by the central government. On the other hand, those deemed exceptionally trustworthy are eligible for certain benefits such as discount flight bookings. However, the central government has made it clear that any negative consequences of the social credit can only be based on the violation of the pre-existing law and cannot be based on arbitrary whims of the government bureaucrats. Therefore, when authorities in Sweeney County attempted to develop a system where citizens did indeed receive scores based on various actions and had access to social services restricted if that score became too low, both the residents and the state media attacked the initiative, comparing it to good citizen certificates issued by Japan during its wartime occupation of China, an initiative was immediately scrapped. Therefore, the dystopian Western vision of the social credit system as a totalitarian imposition on an unwilling and dull citizenry could not be further from the truth. As one Western report on the matter notes, there is no shortage of examples where central and local governments reconsidered or reversed decisions after popular protest. Within the ambit of the social credit system itself, the response to the abortive swinging trial demonstrates the difficulty of implementing a policy that is largely rejected by the citizenry. More recently, the government's response to increasing concerns about user privacy on the dominant online platforms Tencent and Alibaba by shutting down the former social credit trial and reprimanding the latter further underscores the need to ensure citizens are, at least for the most part, on board with the program. Nevertheless, let us deal with the elephant in the room. Where does this idea of a numerical credit rating, which captivated Western imagination, come from? It is, in fact, real, but not in the way Westerners think of it. By and large, it comes from the so-called Sesame Credit and is developed by Alibaba. When Alibaba was starting out as a digital intermediary for buyers and sellers, as well as mobile payment system, it faced the same problem of trust that we have already described earlier. How to develop trust in this digital marketplace when barely anyone had credit cards, let alone measurable credit histories or scores? Sesame Credit was Alibaba's solution. Much like with the initial development of the credit scores in the West, Alibaba used various proxies available to it in order to develop a numerical score which would indicate trustworthiness of a user on its platform. It is this score that is indeed affected by one's social activities, friendships on the platform and other indicators. However, Sesame Credit functions only as a private program akin to corporate loyalty programs in the West with absolutely no legal implications with regards to one's score. Sesame Credit indeed outgrown Alibaba and became a cultural phenomena with some people even sharing their scores on digital platforms. Furthermore, due to Alibaba signing deals with other businesses, a high Sesame Credit score indicating a level of trustworthiness can grant certain perks. For instance, one can rent a bicycle without a deposit. However, the system itself is entirely voluntary. While more dystopian articles in the Western media present this as a top-down system of social control, in reality it is a system that is constantly developing through feedback loops with civil society. So, for instance, when certain experimentation of local governments transgresses what is deemed acceptable by the public, the latter makes its position clear and the policies are adjusted accordingly. In general, Chinese people do not view the social credit system as an issue of the government versus the people, but as something that is being built together by the country as a whole. Therefore, considering the views of the Chinese public of the system in general, Western surveys find overwhelming support. According to the latest survey, more than 80% of the population supports the social credit system. It would be difficult to expect otherwise, considering that the system was initiated to deal with very concrete, tangible, bread and butter issues of a common Chinese citizen. With regards to privacy concerns, the same survey showed that almost 80% of the Chinese trust the central government the most with regards to their private data. The central government is followed by provincial and then municipal governments, state-owned companies, foreign and then local enterprises. Consequently, recent years have also seen the development of new legislation to prevent data abuse from companies handling Chinese data, both inside the country and abroad, in what is called the Personal Information Protection Law. In many respects, it has been described as more comprehensive than GDPR by being more strict regarding third parties and data transfers. 
Furthermore, when representatives of Western businesses operating in China have been surveyed about the corporate social credit system, only 8% viewed it negatively, with majority either supporting or holding neutral views, because it is expected to decrease bureaucratic overhaul. This much was also recognized by a report prepared by the request of the US Congress. This project has considerable potential to enhance the bureaucratic efficiency of the Chinese state, increasing its predictive capacity and regulatory responsiveness, which could in turn enhance party legitimacy in China and other countries. As we can see, the social credit system has really nothing to do with sensational dystopian views found in Western media. That much is recognized even by Western experts, who are otherwise extremely critical of China and its system. Instead of being a social tracking system, it is entirely unrelated to public surveillance system and does not use any biometric data. Instead of being a top-down system of social control, it was initiated to deal with very concrete problems of an average Chinese citizen and has widespread approval. Instead of being a system ascribing ratings to citizens, it by and large works as a binary system of blacklisting. Instead of rating people's activities and social life, it is based entirely on the existing law and regulations. But why are Westerners so insistent about China's system being one of totalitarian control, despite all the evidence to the contrary? At the end of the day, it is not simply a mistake or a misconception. It is rather a projection onto China of the ills and degeneration of our own societies. These dystopian visions of absolute digital control tells more about our own societies and the corruption of our own elites rather than China and the Communist Party. Like the author of the first hit piece on China's social credit system said, this really seemed to be pointing the way towards a dark potential future. There were frankly a lot of signs and similarities of things happening in the United States. The Chinese system uses data to deal with the concrete problems of an average Chinese citizen with the overwhelming support of the Chinese masses. It is digitalization with Chinese characteristics. We must neither copy China nor judge it. Instead, we must ensure that the inevitable digitalization in our own societies result in solutions to the problems of our working families and within the context of our own civilization instead of being used for the enrichment of the oligarchs and imperialist warfare.